start. So welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, the second uh, uh, session of this fourth theme on uh, platform and revenue management. Um, and similarly, to, so this is a continuation of the third session with uh, Florian Choiken from INSEAD. Uh, we'll not delay you more this time, Florian, so go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks, Victor. Good to see everyone um, again. So, um, yeah, so I'll continue with, with this short course on RM and platforms and uh, my side of things, uh, which is online advertising. Um, and before I get into today, just figured maybe I would set um, up a little bit what we did last time and, uh, and, and where, where we are. So last time we looked at two online advertising problems. Uh, so we looked at a revenue optimization uh, problem with, with contracts, um, which was also called the ad display problem, if you remember. Um, and this was, this was a sort of plain vanilla type of um, resource allocation problem. We also looked at um, a problem that was um, from the perspective of an advertiser, which was how should you optimally bid in an ad auction? Now, moving towards today, what's the maybe most important thing to contextualize out of what we've done so far? Well, we looked at two different kinds of, um, of revenue management problems where effectively what we did to handle the uncertainty in user query arrivals, and that was sort of the central problem that we were, we were dealing with last time. Um, the way that we handled it was via a fluid model. Um, and what we did with this fluid model is we got some asymptotic guarantees for um, how well the fluid policy was doing. Okay, so as I advertised uh, then, that was the first session. So the first session was about how we can use these kinds of fluid models for online advertising. Um, the, the session today is actually sort of the opposite of this, which is to ask, and since also the, the, the bigger theme of this workshop is stochastic modeling, well, what I thought we would do is maybe just broaden the picture of what kind of models. So, so if we wanna handle uncertainty for online advertising, but more broadly, I mean, online advertising is maybe just a pretext, but just more broadly, uh, these kinds of resource allocation problems under uncertainty, um, well, what might be a broader range of models of uncertainty that we could think about? And uh, how do the algorithms uh, change when we consider other kinds of models of uncertainty? And uh, well, basically, uh, what kind of problems can we solve and what kind of problems can we not solve? Okay, so basically the theme of today will be, uh, are there some interesting alternatives that we can have um, that move us away from fluid models? Okay, so first of all, Maybe, uh, let me even ask, um, why should we even think about moving away from fluid models? Well, in a nutshell, I think that fluid models, uh, well, here's some, here some shortcomings that we could, we could think about uh, when we deal with these, with these kinds of fluid models and analysis, okay? So the central piece of uh, the fluid models that we saw last time uh, was framing the problem via this deterministic LP and then extracting some kind of control out of this deterministic LP, okay? Well, if one uses this kind of algorithmic approach, well, what might be the issues? Well, one issue um, might be that at uh, sort of really large scales, so at sort of online advertising scale. So think about you know, problems with, with dimension of, of millions, billions of, of different user types. Um, actually, even framing the problem as a linear optimization might be something that's quite challenging. So even solving the deterministic LP that a fluid model would give you, um, that's something that might be quite difficult to do. The other issue, issue B, um, is that, <coughs> Um, even being, being able to write down that deterministic LP will require some knowledge of what are the rates of all the different processes of user arrivals. Um, and that might be in itself something that you may not have access to as a decision maker. Okay, so even solving the deterministic LP, uh, you'll, you'll need some knowledge of something that could be very, very difficult to forecast, um, certainly because it's very, very high dimensional. And also generally when you're dealing with these kinds of 
online advertising markets, uh, you're dealing with very unpredictable, unpredictable types. Okay, so think about you know, the density of arrivals of a particular time is going to be correlated to all sorts of crazy covariates, like whatever, a news shock or, uh, you know, like someone tweets something, uh, really, who knows what. So basically, A and B um, are already two potential shortcomings that one has to deal with if one uses a fluid model as, a, as an algorithmic approach. There's also a second, well, maybe a third issue. Um, which is to even think about, well, what are the guarantees that you can get via this kind of uh, fluid model? And in some sense, you know, the, the way I think about what kind of guarantees you can get via a fluid model is with a fluid model, you're, you're dealing with some kind of random quantity of, of what your arrivals are. So like some kind of Poisson process. And really what you're doing is if, if you split this as, a, as an uncertain quantity, into its rate, its deterministic rate, and then um, a shock. There's just sort of the Poisson noise that goes on top of that rate. Well, effectively what you're doing via a fluid approach is <coughs> with a deterministic linear program, you take, um, you take the, deter the deterministic rate and you use that as a model of the world via the, deter the deterministic linear program and you set up your control just to that deterministic view of things. Um, and then really what you need to do is you need to handle this, this sort of Poisson noise, the second term here, which is, which is the random term. And what a fluid model does is, you know, in essence, it just finds a regime in which you can look at this term um, in which this term goes to zero. Okay, so in some sense with a fluid model, um, when you can get a guarantee via the fluid model, it's to begin with because you found some kind of scaling of the problem where basically the, the Poisson noise doesn't, doesn't matter so much, okay? So these are perhaps three shortcomings of the fluid model that um, warrant why we could think about, well, maybe something else, okay? And the theme of today will be, like I said, to broaden kind of our modeling choices are, you know, different technologies that we could have uh, to even approach these kinds of um, allocation under uncertainty problem problems, um, obviously there's not going to be any free lunches. So we'll look at different models. Um, all of them will have uh, some strengths, but they'll also have some shortcomings of their own, um, and uh, and we'll need to think about that. So that's where that's where we're going. So what I try to do here is just kind of place create kind of a map of all the different ways um, that you could specify a model of uncertainty for um, online advertising or resource allocation. Okay, so here's some, some uh, boxes on this map that we kind of already know. So you can think about, you know, if you model uncertainty, well, you could start at sort of the easiest end of the spectrum, which is just deterministic arrivals. Okay, so nothing particularly interesting to be said there. If there is no uncertainty, then, well, there's no uncertainty, you know uh, what you need to do. The model of uncertainty that we've uh, dealt with uh, already was fluid models. So here you strap on some kind of stochasticity into, into so there's some kind of stochastic process that, that governs this uncertainty. Um, and um, well, you can, you have all this deterministic uh, linear program uh, fluid analysis technology for how to handle this. Okay, so these are the two, these are the two boxes that, that we sort of know how to handle. Uh, but then there's three other boxes that are new and, and those are really the ones that I wanna talk about today. Okay, so one box is actually the other extreme from deterministic arrivals. So <laughs> if one way to model the problem is to say there's no uncertainty, well, the other extreme is to just say that uncertainty can't even be governed by some kind of probabilistic rule. So that, that would be the world of adversarial arrivals. So just imagine uh, you know, your arrivals are generated by nature and nature is an adversary that just tries to pick whatever pattern of arrivals is, is worse for you uh, to minimize the performance of your algorithm. Okay, so, so that's, that's one uh, potential thing that we can talk about. Um, and then, Within the kind of models of uncertainty where we're still talking about probability, 
you're still talking about nature being bound to a probability distribution for, for how it generates its arrivals. Uh, there's two other models that I wanna talk about. Uh, one being random order models and the other being uh, stochastic rate fluid models, okay? So these are the new things that I wanna talk about. Then the sequence, I'm gonna talk about uh, random order models first, um, adversarial arrival second, and um, hopefully there's gonna be enough time um, crossing my fingers this time uh, to also talk a little bit about stochastic uh, rate models. <coughs> and what I have here is I try to kind of summarize, you know, what, what are the different results uh, about all these four different uh, views of the world that, uh, that I'm putting out here. Um, what's inside this table is not particularly important at this stage. I'll circle back and, and I'll kind of recap everything. But just generally, when you have all these different models of uncertainty, I think maybe the big dimensions that we need to think about when we evaluate how these models work um, are, well, each one of these models will come with some kind of algorithm for, for how, to, how to solve uh, the problem. And it will be interesting for us to kind of think about what's the computational building block of each algorithm. So are we talking about solving an LP? Are we talking about solving several LPs? Are we talking about something else altogether? Um, and obviously the second sort of big dimension being, what's the performance guarantee that we're talking about? Are we getting something that's approximately optimal, asymptotically optimal, et cetera? Um, and maybe even a third box that I don't have here is, is sort of flexibility. So if I design an algorithm for this particular type of resource allocation problem, um, is this an algorithm that's actually flexible? As in, could I plug it into a different type of allocation problem that looks a bit similar? Uh, or is it something that's so tailored that basically, as soon as you try to transport it to some other uh, kind of variation of the problem, kind of the wheels come off and, and nothing works anymore, okay? But these are the kinds of things that uh, I want us to think about. Any questions? So just stop me um, if, if anything, anything comes up. So we're gonna be thinking about all these uh, four different models of uncertainty. Uh, the running example that I'll be using for most of these models um, is something called the AdWords problem. So what's the AdWords problem? Um, well, the AdWords problem is, is quite similar to, to what we saw last time. So again, we have some kind of bipartite matching between uh, user queries that are arriving to, I don't know, a publisher's website, um, and they need to be allocated to different advertisers. So let's say that we have n user queries. Let's say that there's n advertisers. Now, this picture to you might look quite similar to the ad display problem that we were looking at before. Uh, what's a little bit different in this problem, the AdWords problem versus the ad display problem, um, is that now the advertisers are not gonna have a capacity as a resource constraint. They're just gonna have a dollar budget constraint, okay? So what does this mean? <laughs> well, a user will arrive, a user query will arrive, and each query will have a vector of bids from all the different advertisers. So let's say that the uh, advertiser J has a bit of BIJ for this particular user query. And now what happens is that if there's an allocation across this edge, um, what happens in the resource consumption constraint is that the budget um, gets this bid BIJ subtracted from it. So we're basically talking about a dollar constraint. Uh, the objective is to maximize platform revenues and the arrival process. Well, since we're talking about different models of uncertainty, uh, we have a question mark here and we'll populate it with uh, different types of, of models. Okay, but this is, this is the basic um, type of matching problem that we're gonna be trying to solve today. Any questions about this? And as we'll see, by the way, I mean, making this resource constraint a dollar-based budget rather than a capacity-based uh, budget, you know, may seem quite innocuous. Uh, what we'll see is that it's it's actually quite a big difference. So it's it's not as innocuous as as it might sound. <coughs> okay, so let's start talking about uh, one model of uncertainty. Uh, which is random order model. And again, uh, we're kind of moving away from the typical uh, modeling assumptions that we would make 
to set up a fluid model. So what's the high level of idea of a random order model? Well, <laughs> let's say that we have our n user queries. So query one will come with some uh, vector of bids, query i will come with some other vector of bids. Okay. Um, and this is just something that's set ahead of time. So now, where does the randomness come in? Well, what happens in this random order model is that uh, before queries actually start arriving to, to the platform, um, nature, what it will do is it will take this set, set of n different, uh, m different queries. And what it will do is it will randomly permute them. Okay, so imagine that nature will pick a permutation um, at random uniformly from the set of permutations. And it's gonna shuffle all these different queries at random so that basically any order, uh, any sequence of these queries is, is equally likely. And then this will actually be the sequence in which the queries arrive to the platform. And then the platform starts seeing these queries in random order. It starts making allocation decisions. And the question is, well, how can the platform make these allocation decisions as well as possible? Okay, clear model. So basically now the, the randomness comes from the fact that there's, there's shuffle, okay? Uh, and sorry, platform... Brian, what is shuffled is the vector B of every query or the, the sequence of uh, queries? No, no, so the shuffling doesn't happen inside a vector. The no. shuffling means that basically- Just the sequence. Yeah, so you're gonna get a permutation and the permutation is gonna tell you that the order in which uh, the first query arrives is sigma one, uh, I is sigma I all the way through sigma N. And then you just you just actually these queries then arrive um, uh, as the sigma says they should arrive. Right. Does that does that? Yeah, it's clear. Just, uh... Yeah. Um, so in this model, what does the decision maker, the platform, know? Um, well, the platform actually knows m, so it knows how many queries are going to come, but it doesn't know obviously the sigma, so it doesn't know the order. And it actually also doesn't know what these bids are. Okay, so in fact, you could think that nature adversarially chooses the bids, but then the sigmas have to come from uh, this uh, uniformly picked uh, permutation. Okay. <coughs> so um, what I'm gonna follow and what I'll show you is an algorithm that actually comes from this Devonor Hayes uh, 2009 paper for the AdWords problem. And uh, you know, it, it actually morphed into, it sort of become its own literature stream, but just for now, I wanna focus on this, on this algorithm. So what I'm gonna do is with this setup in this sort of random order model, I'm gonna construct an algorithm that will achieve at least a one minus epsilon um, um, uh, multiplicative error versus the offline optimal, okay? Um, <coughs> And by the way, by off, on the offline optimal, I'll, I'm basically talking about a perfect hindsight upper bound. So let's actually assume that you, you, you got to see all the bids, the order, whatever you did, whatever you wanted to do. Um, and then you computed this, this um, perfect hindsight upper bound. And I'm gonna show you that you can, you can do at least one minus epsilon um, of that, okay? And the construction will proceed in um, several steps. So let's go through these steps and, and, and try to do the construction. Any questions? So here's the construction. Let's actually just start with thinking about what would be the offline optimum of this problem. Okay. So, <laughs> and this will be this will be our benchmark. So let's actually assume that the decision maker had clairvoyant knowledge of all the queries, everything. Well, in this case, this is something that we saw last time. Uh, well, relatively easy to think about what are the decision makers' um, optimal revenues or platforms' optimal revenues, okay? Well, there is something that you can set up as, a, as an optimization problem um, where you're maximizing. So the decision variable is xij. So xij basically tells you uh, whether you're gonna allocate um, query i to advertiser j. And what you're doing is you're maximizing the sum of bids times these, these xijs, subject to what? A budget constraint, okay, um, and a supply constraint. Okay. 
okay? And if we wanted to be picky, um, we could actually formulate this as an integer program because in real life, we can't really allocate a query fractionally. So we can set this up as an integer program and uh, the value of this integer program, which I'll call the offline opt, well, that's basically the best that you can do. Okay, that's the offline optimal. Any questions about this? No, okay. So now that was the first step. What are we gonna do next? Well, you can imagine that the problem is sort of the scale of the problem, something that advise you first of all, is that you know, this integer constraint doesn't really matter that much, okay? So let's just throw it away. Um, so let's just think about the problem as a pure linear program. So this is my linear program. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do one trick that actually allows us to sort of implement the control that would be suggested by this linear program um, as a bit price control. So how are we gonna do that? Well, <laughs> we, can we can start with a primal offline LP, but then we can write the dual of this offline LP, um, which will have a dual variable new i, sorry, uh, a dual variable new i here tied to um, each one of the supply constraints and a dual variable new j tied to each one of the budget constraints of an advertiser, okay? <clears throat> and then what do we know? Well, by complementary slackness, um, if one of the allocations from i to j is, is strictly positive, then what must happen is that this constraint here has to be tight. So new i has to be equal to the maximum of bij maximum over all advertisers of bij times one minus mu j, okay? This is just a complementary slackness uh, property of the optimal uh, primal dual solution. So what is this bias? Well, I'm just rewriting the complementary slackness condition here. Uh, the complementary slackness basically suggests a bit price control policy like we talked about last time, uh, but also like you might have seen before for the network revenue management uh, problem when uh, Renee was talking about it. So what would be the bid price control policy? Well, let's say that what it would be is that if a query, a user query I comes in, I need to think which, al which advertiser I allocate it to. <coughs> well, why don't I just take the max of the, uh, the, the actual bid of that advertiser but discounted by their uh, opportunity cost of budget. And this is gonna give me some kind of uh, you know, transform bid, some kind of shaded uh, bid, and I just allocate it to the largest shaded bid. Okay, so I just do, um, I just sort of discount the bid by opportunity cost and, and I go with the highest bid in that, in that space, okay? So the optimal, the, the algorithm, that I'm going to show you is an algorithm that uses this kind of bid price control policy to do the allocation. But the thing though, is that it's not really clear that it's, you know, at this stage, I've actually bought myself anything because I've simply moved the problem from finding out what the X stars are to finding out what these mu's are, okay? So now to actually be able to apply and use this bid price control policy, what I would need to know is all the mu's of all the different advertisers. Um, and if I actually knew these, I could, I could run the bid price control policy, but finding out the mu's would require that I solve the dual. The dual will have the same information structure as, as the prior. So to be able to solve this, this offline dual, um, I would still need to know the, all the bids, all the order of arrivals, you know, basically all of the online information I would need to know, okay? So that's why I actually need a third step um, to actually resolve this problem, okay? So how can I, how can I actually come up with some kind of uh, muse in, uh, in real life? Well, the idea of the algorithm <coughs> is to actually try to learn some kind of estimate for these true muse, okay? So what the algorithm will do is it will, bid, it will build some estimate mu hat in an exploration phase 
Okay, so what the algorithm will try to do is just use some of the data to estimate a mu. And then what it's going to do is on the rest of the data, it's going to be using these mu estimates to actually do um, allocations. Okay, so how does the algorithm work exactly? Well, this is the sequence of user arrivals. Okay, so this is the first user arrival. This is the nth user arrival. And what the algorithm will do is it will set aside some epsilon fraction of all the user queries. And on this epsilon fraction, uh, maybe it'll just do random assignments. Doesn't even matter how it actually assigns those queries to advertisers. But what it will do is once it's actually seen this epsilon fraction of the samples, epsilon fractions, fra fraction of user, uh, user query arrivals, um, it will actually use these fractions to create sort of a sampled version of, a, of, of, of the offline linear program. Okay, so I don't know all the queries, but at least I know this like tiny fraction of the queries. Let me actually set up a linear program that just uses this subset of queries. Okay, so what's the what's the sampled linear program? <coughs> I'm doing this in dual space. So I'm showing you the the dual linear program. Well, it's the same as before, except that I'm only considering the first um, epsilon times m queries. I need to appropriately uh, transform the budget. So I need to scale down the budget to reflect uh, that basically this, this problem has an epsilon uh, uh, time horizon compared to the original time horizon. And then the constraints are the same. Okay, so I'll use the first couple of samples. I'll solve this. I'm gonna get a mu hat, an estimate mu hat. And then I'm actually gonna take this estimate mu hat and I'm gonna use it um, as bit price con controls for the rest of the uh, user queries, okay? Is it clear how the algorithm works? So, what can you actually show for this algorithm? Well, let V sampled LP be the revenues that are generated by this algorithm. Um, what we want to do is we want to bound something called the competitive ratio. So what's the competitive ratio? Well, it's the revenues that are generated by this algorithm <coughs> divided by the offline optimal uh, revenues. And obviously what you'd want to do is you want to make this competitive ratio as high as possible. Well, here's a proposition. So what this proposition says is that uh, with this epsilon uh, fraction of samples that you use for learning, the algorithm is one minus epsilon competitive for the adverts problem, but only on inputs that uh, broadly speaking are large enough, okay? So if the input is large enough that the true optimal of the problem um, over B max, where B max is basically just the maximum bid out of all the user queries. If this ratio is greater than, um, well, N squared, which is the number of advertisers, uh, times log uh, lambda over epsilon over epsilon cubed, well, then this instance is large enough that um, the algorithm actually admits this one minus epsilon competitive ratio, okay? And the lambda here, it's basically just the maximum ratio of any possible two bits. So what you essentially need to do is control um, that you don't have a very, very small bit and a very large bit at, at the same time. Somehow you need to control this well, okay? So that's the result. Um, you do the sampling, you solve the a sampled LP, you use the um, estimated bit prices out of the sampled LP uh, to do bit price control. And it turns out that in this random order model, uh, you actually get a pretty good value. So as long as it's a different kind of result than a fluid model result, but in some sense it actually, conceptually speaking, it does something similar. As in, you need to have a large, in, large enough instance, okay, which is the sort of asymptotics that you'd need for a fluid model as well. And if the instance is large enough, 
uh, well, basically for any epsilon error that you pick, um, you're going to be able to get a one minus epsilon um, guarantee. <coughs> so can I, can I ask a question? Sure, Ron. So, so in this model, you just, um, you choose the length of the learning phase proportional to the length of the, the horizon, right? If Yeah, yeah. So if that epsilon was some kind of a function of n, could you somehow perhaps get, get a better result, a better, a better bound, something that does not require this, uh, that does not depend on the size of, of, the, of the problem? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's a very good point. So the way that this, the way that this result is, is sort of phrased, is as if so so you have m samples m uh, sorry the sort of horizon of the problem is m there's m arrivals of queries um and the way that this result is phrased is you know pick some constant fraction epsilon times m and just use that for learning so you're right that it's it's it is very very interesting to think about epsilon as uh you know some kind of some kind of function of of m so for instance you know can you get away with epsilon well some function of it. Um, you can. I think that basically what you would be able to get is that uh, this will be O of m two thirds. So uh, I'll need to I'll need to go back. So basically, you need to you need to see if you try to make uh, epsilon parametric on m, you need to figure out exactly how you could. Uh, how you could get this condition. And I want to say that you get something like O of M to the two thirds. Um, and this is actually not the best that you could do. So I think the best that you can do is something like O of M to the one half, but not with this kind of explore first and then exploit, not with this kind of output. You need to do something a little bit smarter uh, to, to be able to get there. But yeah, certainly the name of the game, you know, theoretically is you'd want to ask, you know, how can epsilon depend on M? Um, I think really in practice, what people can do, what people do in practice is basically they pick whatever epsilon will still allow their computer to solve the LP. Basically, you just you just go as high as whatever, you know, your computation, your computational power is, is, is the bound there. Um, Florian, a quick question. I, I, there's no condition on the small bi k's, right? The, yeah, that, that, I mean, that b max. No, no, I mean, well, there's, there's two conditions. So basically the one condition is some kind of, uh, you know, maximum, maximum ratio between the small, the small b's and the big b's, the small bids and the largest bids. Yeah, and but then I the condition is just part of the, I understand, but I'm saying on the bi j that the way you defined it earlier, there were no, it's not like, for example, we can take the bij taken from some distribution. Uh, they're just um, numbers, you know. Any they're number. just numbers. They're just numbers. So, so actually, for for this to be so, this is correct in a world where the adversary actually picks the bij whatever they want, but right. up to this lambda and b max. Right. Um, and then you know the the adversary is only bounded by having to shuffle. Yeah. the order of arrivals yeah but the bees could actually come adversary yeah. Yeah. so that's the bound i'm not going to try to prove uh, this bound but i want to give you a little bit of a sense of what the proof strategy is for for how you how you'd get a proof out of this okay so so some core elements of of how you can prove this proposition so at a very very high level and i'm i'm, I'm sweeping a lot of details under the rug here at a very high level for the sampled LP to produce, you know, in quotation marks, um, good dual price estimates. What it has to do is somehow it needs to produce, you know, the dual LP will use some kind of bid price. And if you actually think about um, the estimate spend, so the spend just on the samples uh, that are produced by the, by the sample dual LP, it's somehow, if you try to extrapolate those, 
they have to be pretty close to what the true spend would be. Okay, so in some sense, the, the estimate spend minus epsilon, because you, you need to weigh it by a epsilon to be apples to apples, uh, times the spend, it needs to be something that's, that's bounded, that's small enough for all the different advertisers. Okay, so in some sense, what you need to do via the sample del P is you need to estimate the spends correctly. Okay, so then um, how does the proof do this? Well, if you look at this equation, this equation looks a little bit like some kind of concentration of random variables, okay? And that's exactly what the proof does. Basically what the proof does is uh, it uses uh, concentration results. So it uses a variant of Bernstein's inequality. The, the, the exact, the exact uh, inequality that it uses is, is here. Um, and it uses this to control basically how large these, these errors uh, in spends can be. Okay. So the reason why I mentioned this was that, you know, if I had to summarize basically what's, what happens at the core of these random order models to make them work, to get these one minus epsilon type results, um, you're still kind of in a world where you can use concentration results. So at the core of why the proof works is that concentration still holds and I can just apply, you know, Bernstein bounds, whatever machinery you have, whatever your favorite concentration inequality is um, to be able to control and, 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 get, uh, and get a result. So we're seeing the first model of uncertainty. Now, conceptually, what, how should we, how can we compare this? Uh, to fluid models. Well, one thing about the, this, this sample del P result is strong in two senses. So in one sense, there's information structure. Something that's nice about the sample del P is that I don't need to plug in some kind of rate forecast as I had to do in the deterministic LP in, uh, in a fluid model. This is something that just kind of uses an epsilon worth of data and uses the raw data itself to, to sort of figure itself out and, and produce uh, dual prices. So in terms of information structure, it's, it's something that is perhaps better. Um, maybe an even bigger buy is actually on the computational side. So there's, this, there's some idea of dimension reduction that the sample del P allows you to do because uh, you know, sort of the largest dimension computationally that you have to worry about it's just a number of queries that you have to feed into the optimization problem. Uh, here, you essentially, what you're saying is that, well, maybe I can just sample some of these queries. So I can only use like maybe 1% of these queries rather than 100%. And I can just plug those into a much smaller LP and uh, that will be good enough. So there's, there's some dimensionality reduction that's, that's happening here as well. On the other hand, you know, maybe what's not so great about these fluid models, um, is that it's not really clear whether we've moved so far away from, uh, sorry, what's, great, what's not so great about these random order models, it's, it's that it's not so clear we've moved very far away from either a fluid model or an IID model. Okay. Because at the very heart of what I was saying makes the proof work is concentration. So you're still living in some kind of IID type world, some kind of stationary world where concentration still applies. Uh, the guarantees still come from those kinds of properties. Um, so it's not really clear whether we've constructed a model that, you know, on that entire spectrum from deterministic to full-on adversarial models, uh, we've moved super, super far away towards um, adversarial models. Okay. But that's what it is. Any questions? So what I also wanna give you here is um, a broader literature for these kinds of random order models. If you wanna read more, uh, maybe if you're interested in working on this. Um, it also speaks actually to another benefit of these random order models, They're actually pretty flexible. So since the Devon or Hayes paper, people have been applying this as a technology to all sorts of other resource allocation problems. So we've seen it for AdWords, but you can do this for ad display. Uh, people have, uh, use this for general online packing problems, uh, even online convex programming problems. Um, and it's, a, it's actually a pretty flexible technology. It's a technology where, you know, uh, you can actually legitimately 
start with a different, you can actually take a new problem and you have a pretty good shot that you, know, you, you frame it as a random order model um, and you actually be able to uh, make it work, okay? Uh, in, in a day or two, I promise I will uh, put uh, you know, the exact citations and uh, all the different reading resources that I gave you on the website. So uh, it's easy for you to find um, all these papers. Okay, that's random order models. So we've seen another type of model, a different way of modeling uncertainty. Like I said, you know, some benefits, uh, also potentially some um, issues with uh, this, this different way of modeling uncertainty. So we've crossed this one out. That was number one. Now, here's a different model of uncertainty. Let's actually jump all the way to adversarial arrivals. And let me stick with this AdWords problem and see what one could say um, in a fully adversarial model of um, arrivals of uncertainty for this kind of AdWords problem. And what's interesting and you know, maybe a little bit surprising even is that in fact, there, there are interesting things to be said about these kinds of problems uh, with adversarial arrivals. Okay, so let's switch the model and see what that's about. So in an adversarial model, how, how should you think about this? Um, well, you can literally think about this as the arrivals are chosen by nature. And nature plays the role of a devil. So nature actually gets to see whatever algorithm, bid price control policy, whatever it is that you're using to make decisions. And nature looks into that. And it actually picks exactly the um, arrivals that will minimize how much money you make from your algorithm. Okay, so basically nature just tailors the, 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 the arrivals exactly to your algorithm to try to, uh, to try to hurt you as much as possible. Okay, think about this as, um, uh, think about this as a max min kind of game. It's basically a worst case uh, type of game. This is obviously a great model of uncertainty in the sense that, um, well, you can't get any more uncertain than this. So this is sort of the hardest model of uncertainty that you could possibly work in. Um, it could be extremely conservative, uh, but potentially a very, very good model for, um, for web traffic. Okay? So in fact, uh, when people started building online advertising systems, this was the model that they started working in. And part of it was that, well, I think originally those people were computer scientists. And, and this, is, this is the way that a computer scientist would think about uncertainty. Uh, but also the second way was that, you know, it was just really, really difficult to even come up with some kind of forecast model of, of all these different arrivals, you know, this particular type of user, this other type of user, how is this gonna shape out in the future? Uh, so this was actually a pretty good way to uh, start modeling the problem, okay? And, what I'll show you here is an algorithm that comes from computer science. Um, it's an algorithm that, uh, come, that started out in this paper here, um, and also this Meta, Saberi, Vazirani, and Vazirani paper, uh, and a couple of others uh, before it. And this will be an algorithm where, first of all, what we're going to lose is we're not going to have any kind of uh, epsilon optimal. So we're not gonna be able to do as good as offline optimal. The uncertainty is just harsh enough to us that we can't reach the offline optimal. The best that we're gonna be able to do is maybe we're gonna be able to uh, get some kind of constant fraction of the offline optimal. And the cost of constant fraction that we're gonna get is one minus one over um, E. Okay, so roughly, I wanna say 67% of offline optimal. <laughs> and we're, but the thing is that we're going to be able to do this in the presence of an adversary, so adversarial arrivals, but with one assumption. Okay, so nature is going to be able to do anything it wants, except that it's going to be constrained that when it, when it chooses the bids of all the different advertisers, um, it needs to pick bids that are relatively small compared to the budgets of the advertisers. Okay, so fully adversarial modulo this uh, small bid assumption. Okay, and it's actually a pretty 
pretty innocuous assumption to make because in the real world, uh, you know, an advertiser will, over the course of a day where it sets its budget, um, it will actually win like literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of different, uh, of different queries. So obviously how much it pays for each individual query is gonna be uh, pretty small compared to their daily budget. Okay, so not much of a problem uh, about that. Okay, so with this small bids assumption, uh, we're gonna look at an algorithm and the algorithm will use dual variables on advertiser budget constraints. So the same kind of news that we were dealing with in the, in the, in, in the random order model sampled LP. Um, but the way that it's gonna construct these dual variables is gonna be different. And that's why it's gonna get a different kind of guarantee in a different demand model. <laughs> okay, so just to remind us, this is the structure of the AdWords problem. So uh, dollar budgets, uh, these are the bids of the users. We have to think about how to match these users. And now our arrival process is gonna be something that's adversarial. So no structure, no probability distribution that tells me how these different user queries are gonna arrive over time. Okay, so again, the model that we're gonna be using to, to come up with an algorithm will be to start with the offline LP and the dual of the offline LP. Okay, so there's nothing new here. This is the old primal offline LP with value the offline opt. Uh, this is the dual offline LP with the same uh, value by, by, by strong value. Okay. And we can think about the complementary slackness conditions of an optimal pair of primal and dual variables. And as before, the complementary slackness condition will give us the bid price control policy that you just allocate to the advertiser that has the maximal adjusted bid bij times one minus mu j. So now here's what's gonna be different because it's all adversarial now. Um, some kind of approach like before, let me look at the first epsilon arrivals, try to estimate a mu j, actually use that as a bid price control policy. That's hopeless because what will, the, what will nature do then? It will figure out exactly what are the first epsilon samples to throw at you that are gonna maximize you know, how badly you estimate the, the mu j's compared to what the true mu j should be, okay? So any kind of sampling approach is actually hopeless, um, which is why what the real algorithm does, and uh, this is called a primal dual algorithm, is it will actually, over the course of the time horizon, so basically as, as queries, new queries arrive, what it will do is it will have an update rule where it will iteratively update the primal and dual variables x and mu and nu. Okay. And what, it's, what we're gonna get at the end of the day after all these updates is, well, first of all, the primal variables will count the revenues of the algorithm. Okay, so we're gonna pick some xij's and then we're gonna look at some of bij xij. What the dual variables are supposed to do, and that's why the primal dual algorithm actually constructs these dual variables, is they're not supposed to count the revenues, they're supposed to give you bounds. So we're gonna, we're gonna use the dual variables that this algorithm constructs uh, to actually get um, an upper bound, well, not on the offline opt, but actually versus uh, the offline opt, okay? <laughs> so actually, what the algorithm will, can do, uh, or what the algorithm does can be summarized in this rather long equation here, where at the end of the day, the algorithm is gonna have an X mu nu. And what I'll be able to show is that if I take the X that was produced by the algorithm and I look at the primal value of X, that's gonna be the algorithm revenues. That's gonna be greater or equal to alpha times the dual value of mu and nu. And now because uh, in the dual, mu and nu um, are not necessarily optimal, this has to be greater or equal to, the, to alpha times the offline optimal dual. Okay, so nu and uh, nu are, are suboptimal dual variables. And then by duality, this is gonna be greater than alpha times offline opt in the primal space. 
then that means that prime of x is giving me at least alpha times d of an optimal reference. So basically, this is going to give me an alpha competitive ratio. Does the big picture of how the algorithm works make sense to people? So I just need to be careful in how I, how I create these primal and dual variables so that uh, I can sort of keep this, uh, this, uh, these bounds together, okay? And the trick is going to be, um, I wanna make sure that by the end of the algorithm's execution, um, the primal and the dual variables will be feasible, okay? And then the other question will be is, what is the best alpha that I can possibly have where I will have the sequence of equations and I'll get an alpha competitor fish. Okay. So let's actually see the algorithm. And this time I actually want us to go through a, well, semi-formal proof of uh, the correctness of the algorithm. Okay. So um, <laughs> just for simplicity, let's make all the budgets equal to one for all the advertisers. Okay? And let's define this number rho which is going to be one minus one over e to the minus one. Okay, so I said that the algorithm will end up having a competitive ratio of one minus one over e. So somehow this row is gonna give me the actual competitive ratio, okay? Now let me define this function a of y to be e to the y minus one over e minus one. And then what I'm going to do, and this is sort of the crucial piece of the algorithm, is at any time step, I want to think about this variable yj, which is going to be the fraction of budget spent by advertiser j. Okay, so at a particular time point, I actually look at, you know, this advertiser has spent 70% of their budget or 80% of their budget or whatever it is, and that's going to be yj. And I'm going to define a delta ij that takes in as input this spent budget fraction, and it's going to be equal to rho times uh, e to the yj minus one times bij. Okay, so so far probably not very interpretable what these numbers are, but as, as we go through the proof, uh, they'll, they'll make a bit more sense. Okay, so now what does the algorithm do? Well, it's an iterative algorithm, so it needs to be initialized at something. So we initialize mu j to zero, mu i to zero. And then what happens? Well, queries started arriving. So let's think about what happens when the uh, user query i actually shows up to the decision. Well, what the decision maker will do is it will match i to j to the specific advertiser j that will maximize rho times the bit of the advertiser minus that delta function that I defined before, okay? So the algorithm will do this matching. So by the way, this looks a little bit like a bit price control, but a different functional for the bit price control that one, than what we were seeing before. Okay, so after the algorithm does this matching, um, what it does is uh, it will update the duals. So it will set mu j to the old value of mu j plus this delta, and it's gonna set mu i to um, basically exactly this adjusted bit here. So before seeing why the algorithm works, uh, maybe let's try to think about what the algorithm is trying to do here, okay? So when the algorithm decides to match i to j, what it's doing is it's looking at this adjusted bit, okay? Well, this adjusted bit is actually equal to, and this is just algebra, nothing fancy here, is just equal to rho times bij times one minus e to the yj minus one. So what is happening here? Well, if I think about this term here, what this term really does is it tracks and it's a way to actually adjust how this advertiser J is getting their budget, the speed that this advertiser J is getting their budget uh, spent at, okay? Because think about it this way. So if an advertiser's budget is almost depleted, then this yj, so the fraction of budget spent, is going to be pretty close to one. Okay. So if yj is pretty close to one, then one minus ej, eyj minus one is pretty close to zero. So what does this mean? Well, that particular advertiser's adjusted bid 
will get this counted almost to zero. So basically I'm looking at this advertiser, I'm seeing this guy is pretty close to having, my to, to having their budget spent. Let me just slow down the number of queries that they're actually gonna win. So the, the term here that, that involves YJ is basically just a way to kind of slow down or speed up um, how often this particular advertiser is winning queries. And also conversely, if the budget of this advertiser is, is, is almost full, and uh, what well, this should not be one, this is zero. Well, then one minus e to the yj minus one, that's approximately equal to one, okay? So then basically this term will be as high as possible. And I'm actually gonna be effectively speeding up how many queries the advertiser is winning. Okay, does that make sense? So think about it conceptually as, now my bid price control is something that depends on the actual bid of the advertiser. And then some kind of heuristic that adjusts this bid by how much budget this advertiser has available, okay? And before we were doing this by solving an LP and getting a mu, an actual optimal dual price. Here, because you can't really get that mu, you have some kind of heuristic that you're using to try to, to, try to come up with, with an estimate, okay? <coughs> so the proposition is that this primal dual algorithm with these adjustments um, is going to be one minus one over E competitive for the AdWords problem um, under that small bids assumption. Okay. Let's actually go ahead and prove this. So to be able to prove this, uh, we need two things. So one thing that we need is we wanna make sure that the primal and dual variables that the algorithm constructs at the end of the day, so after all the uh, users have been allocated, uh, this primal and dual variables have to be feasible. And then what we wanna do is we wanna count the revenues of the primal and, and compare them to the revenues of, to the value of the dual, which is gonna give us um, a, a bound, okay? So let's just start with the feasibility. So is X feasible? Well, X is feasible because basically if an advertiser actually exhausts their budget, the way that it, the algorithm works is it turns off the spigot. So whenever the advertiser exhausts their budget, I'm sorry, they have a lot of typos in here. Whenever the advertiser adjusts their, uh, exhausts their budget, YIJ is equal to one, which means that one minus E to the YJ minus one is equal to zero which basically means that the adjusted bid of that advertiser becomes zero. So they'll never try to be allocated a query once they've run out of budget. And this means that basically primal feasibility follows immediately as really just the immediate construction of the algorithm, okay? Now, dual feasibility is a little bit uh, tricky, just a little bit, actually not that much tricky. <laughs> so, how do we start proving uh, dual feasibility? Well, suppose that there are a couple of queries that were allocated uh, up to some time to advertiser J. So I won all the way through I sub K. And let's say that if we were gonna look at the times when those queries were actually allocated to J, um, the fraction spent of budget were YIJ one uh, all the way to YJ um, K. Well, then let's think about um, the algorithm will keep updating the dual price of this particular advertiser. And what is mu j going to be at the time of the i cave arrival, of the i cave query? Okay. <laughs> well, at every point, uh, mu j gets updated to mu j plus this delta i j term. Okay, so that means that if I wanna count mu j over time, it's basically just the sum of each delta ij that was added every time that I actually did an allocation. So it's going to be the sum L equal to one all the way to K of all these deltas. Okay, now at the same time, if I wanna think about uh, yjl, 
Well, is, what is YJL? Well, because budgets are equal to one, the fraction of spent budgets will be equal to the actual spend. So what is the actual spend of YJL? Well, the actual spend of YJL is going to be the sum of all the bids that J is actually one up to this time. So it's going to be the sum of, let's say, um, um, L prime, L prime equal to one all the way to L minus one of B I, uh, B I, sorry. Um, of B I L prime J. Okay, this is just the spend. Okay, so basically instead of Y J L, I can just put down the sum in here. Now, this is where the small bids assumption comes in. So small bids assumption. So what does the small bids assumption say? It says that any one of these bids is much, much smaller than BJ. So I can approach how much I spend when I win one item as just an infinitesimal amount that I add to each YJ. So that means that I can approximate this sum here uh, by an integral. Okay. And the integral will go from y equals zero, so no budget spent, all the way to yjk of rho um, e to the y minus one dy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and now if I just do some algebra, this is equal to a to the y, j, k minus one, e to the minus one. Um, and this is what I define to be um, a of y, j, k. Okay. So basically what I've done is I've actually proved that remember that function a that I defined. So e of uh, y, j minus one over e minus one. If I look at the dual variable mu j that the algorithm is, uh, the algorithm is constructed, at any point in time, this dual variable is equal to a times the uh, a evaluated at yj, which is the fraction of budget spent. Okay. <clears throat> so now, what do I need to do? I need to show dual feasibility. So I want to make sure that nu i is greater or equal to bij times 1 minus mu j at the end of the algorithm. And I need to do this for every y and j. Okay. So how can I actually uh, finish up the proof and, and show this? So I'm focusing on, so nu i greater or equal to bij one minus mu j. Okay, so I'm focusing on the pair ij. So let's say that when this query i arrived to the platform, it actually got allocated to j prime. And let's also say, that when this actually happened, um, the budget consumption of J prime was this Y mid J prime. The budget consumption of J was Y mid J. Um, and let Y J be the budget consumption of my focal advertiser J at the end of the algorithm. Okay. So what do I have? Well, the algorithm will set nu I equal to this guy here. Okay, this is just the construction, the update of new i when the algorithm does an allocation. But why has j prime actually received this query i? It received that query i because j prime had the maximum adjusted bid over all possible other advertisers. So this means that this adjusted bid has to be greater than or equal to the adjusted bid that j would have had at that same time, okay? So basically this is just by uh, the adjusted bit chosen by the algorithm, okay? So now if I just open up Delta IJ and I write it down, um, this is equal to BIJ e to the uh, e over e minus one times one minus e y j mid minus one. Okay. 
And this evaluates to exactly Bij times one minus Ayj mid. Okay. And then what happens? Well, Yj mid tells me how much budget has been consumed somewhere midway through the execution of the alpha. Okay. So budgets can get undepleted. So this has to be less than or equal to Yj. Okay. And a is a monotonic function. So that means that bij one minus a yj mid has to be greater or equal to bij one minus a yj, where yj is the budget spent at the end of alpha. Yeah. And now, before I actually showed that new j, so. I actually showed for this guy here that mu j is equal to a of uh, yj. So then I get this inequality, this equality here. And what I've shown at the end is that nu i is greater or equal to bij one minus mu j. Okay, and that's dual feasibility. So I figured out primal feasibility. I figured out dual feasibility. Now, what else do I need to do to be able to actually uh, wrap up? this whole thing. Well, let's think about every update of this algorithm. So every time it makes an allocation. Well, at every update, I've allocated i to j. So the value of the primal, how much money I'm making, well, it's going to increase by bij. Okay. Now, what happens in the dual space? Well, in the dual space, um, the dual objective increase will be the dual coming from uh, nu j from mu j and mu j as well. Okay. And what is that going to be? Well, the delta in mu j is going to be equal exactly to, so I put the algorithm here so that you can look at the updates, is going to be exactly equal to the, uh, to this delta ij yj. Okay. And then what's the delta in nu i? Well, nu i was never set before. It just gets set now, and this is the only time that nu i gets set. And it's equal to rho bij minus nu i j y j. Okay? So then this plus this is equal to rho bj, bij. So basically, the value of the primal is changed by rho times bij. So what happened then? Well, at every step, my algorithm goes up by bij. The dual goes up by rho times bij. So that implies that the primal evaluated at x is going to be greater than, sorry, this should not be alpha, rho times the dual of, uh, of, uh, of mu and nu. And by suboptimality of nu and nu, this is greater than the offline optimal dual. And by uh, duality, this is greater than rho times the offline optimal prime. Okay, which basically shows, um, sorry, this should actually be one over rho. This shows that the primal of x over the optimal offline is greater or equal to one over rho, which is one minus one over e. And that's the proof. Any questions about this proof? So, so at the end of the day, mm -hmm. uh, even though you kind of departed from the fluid setup, you yeah. still use the this kind of fluid approach by, you know, Im implicitly using the assumption that uh, the beads are small so that you can sort of solve no, uh, the, the mean, spending yeah. spending process as a, it yes. comes out as a solution to an, uh, sort of an ODE, right? Right. I mean, well, yes and no. So there's still some power of the adversary that's limited by the small bids assumption. Uh, but still, even though the bids are small, um, 
so even though the bids are small, the actual sequence of bids, the actual you know arrival pattern of those bids could be anything that you want. So in a fluid model, you know, if I give you a fix this particular type of bid, this particular type of query, right? In a fluid model, once I say it's Poisson, then when I think about how many arrivals are gonna, I'm going to have up to time t, I'm going to have some concentration bounds that tell me, you know, the rate is 100. Uh, you know, the likelihood that I'm going to have 10 million is something that's like 0 0.00000, right? So that's something that I need in the fluid model. That's not something that I have here. If nature wants to throw at me, you know, 10 million, it can throw me 10 million. So, I mean, there's still maybe some, you know, fluid in this, in the sense that, yeah, like with, with just one arrival, essentially, you're kind of saying that nature can't hurt you too much because the bid is going to be small. But still, over time, it can, it can start hurting you a lot just via, you know, changing how many bids you're going to say. So, yeah. But there's still some, I mean, you're right that there's still some kind of, uh, you know, residual fluidness that's uh, that remains in here yeah um okay so we've seen a second model and if we're gonna compare adversarial to fluid versus or random order models well what's good about these well if you look at the performance guarantee the performance guarantee actually looks worse so i'm talking about 67 percent competitive ratio than one minus epsilon for arbitrary epsilon competitive ratio but at the same time, it's in a different arrival model. So, you know, an adversarial arrival model kind of as hard as it can possibly get. Uh, so maybe I should expect that there's going to be some kind of loss. Okay. And I'm only going to be able to do 67%. Um, in fact, you can actually show that there's no algorithm in the world that as long as you're living in this kind of adversarial model, can do better than 67%. So basically, this is the optimal algorithm given the uncertainty model. The other thing that's actually, I mean, I find really, really interesting is that this is the harshest model that we, you can possibly live in uh, that actually gives you the um, easiest computational block, building block. So this is not a method that actually solves an LP. This is a model that does, this is a method that does very simple updates of primal and dual variables, uh, very, very lightweight computation, which is also why, you know, these, these algorithms are super, super, uh, like, super, super, you know, well used in online advertising, because you basically don't have to think about this additional layer of computation of, you know, how do you solve an LP, how do you solve an optimization problem. But actually, that's something else that's fantastic about these models. On the other hand, you know, what's, what are downsides of these adversarial models? Well, one issue is that they're potentially too conservative. So nature might throw you a lot of weird arrivals, but it's not clear that what you see in, in reality is something that's adversarial. So maybe if you do something, if you, if you use an adversarial model, you're just kind of going too far down the rabbit hole. Um, it's also something that doesn't use data in any way. So any of the online data that comes in over time, I'm not doing anything to sort of adjust the way that the algorithm works. There's no, there's no learning in this algorithm. It's highly data agnostic. The other thing that's potentially the, the worst thing about these adversarial models that, is that they actually uh, end up to be extremely tailored. So they generalize very poorly once you move from one problem instance to a different problem instance. So you could think, for instance, you know, if I move from this AdWords problem and I move to the ad display problem that we were seeing uh, in the first session, well, can I construct an, ad an adversarial algorithm for that? Well, it turns out the answer is no. So if I just change that one constraint and I move to an ad display problem, um, you can actually show that there's no algorithm that an adversary can take to a competitive ratio of zero, take down to a competitive ratio of zero. Okay, unless you introduce some special assumptions, some additional assumptions that kind of make this work. So one downside of these algorithms is that they're extremely, extremely brittle. They will work here, very difficult to generalize them to work in a different, in a different setting. So in some sense, to me, they're less of a technology. What's great about fluid models or random order models is that they're a technology. Like you can, you can try to 
you, you set up a different problem as a, as a research question, probably fluid or random order analyses will work. Um, adversarial models, primal dual algorithms, I'm not really sure, unclear, basically. There are you know, various applications. There's other directions in which uh, adversarial models and primal dual algorithms have gone. And I have sort of a mini literature review here, but certainly not the most generalizable of uh, technologies. Okay. <coughs> so, okay, covered random order models. We've covered adversarial arrivals. Uh, the last thing that I'm just gonna blast through because there's not a lot of time left, but I wanna give you a sense of, um, is maybe one last model of uncertainty that I can think about that I can put on this map, uh, which is something that I call stochastic rate fluid models, okay? Before I get into that, any, anything else that's uh, popping up? All right, well, then let's talk about that. So in some sense, um, what you could think about is whether, you know, there's something else, some other way to model uncertainty that kind of combines the good things of probabilistic modeling with the good things of adversarial arrivals. So is there some sort of sweet spot in the middle of these two things? So can you think about something where, you know, you still have a probability distribution that nature is bound to? Uh, but at the same time, this probability law allows nature to throw at you something that's non-stationary, throw at you something that's kind of large shock, while at the same time, you know, not going over overboard and still not giving nature adversarial power that, you know, there's just not much else that you can say about the problem, okay? Well, how can you do this? If one was to go back to the fluid model, um, Here's the essence of a fluid model that I actually started out the, this whole discussion. Effectively, what you're doing with a fluid model is you're making the uncertainty a stochastic process that has known and deterministic rate, lambda i. And what you do is you take what you know, that deterministic rate, and you throw it into an optimization problem. And then you use that optimization problem and what you hope for is that, well, if I actually think about the, the randomness that's built around this mean rate, just Poisson randomness, Poisson noise, well, again, that will kind of wash away, it will go to zero. And basically whatever you're doing with the deterministic picture of the world works fine, okay? So here's another way that you could write down a different type of fluid model. So, you could think about a stochastic rate fluid model. And what you would do in the stochastic rate fluid model is what if you actually made the rate of the process itself something that was uncertain? So what if instead of a lambda i times t, you actually had an uncertain rate, capital lambda, so a random variable. And this was maybe something that was stochastic, maybe something that was non-stationary. Uh, something that maybe I would not be able to forecast, okay? So what if you actually made the rate itself uncertain? And, you know, by the way, Ron, like what you were talking about, you know, the argument that I was saying before, you know, in a fluid model, the process has a rate of 10 and it's very unlikely that will deviate a lot. Now I'm making the 10 a random variable itself. So I'm gonna have more uh, sort of large shocks that I need to deal with. And just to make my life easy, I mean, I could strap a Poisson process on top of this stochastic rate, but let me just not worry about that. So let me just assume that the real arrivals to begin with, they come as some kind of fluid. So I don't, wor I don't worry about this term, but the fluid itself is something that's random, okay? So for this model, um, I'll show you a more generic model of, of resource allocation um, that I can customize to the AdWords problem or the ad display problem that I was talking about before. Okay. So in this model, it's still bipartite matching, but when I actually do an allocation, I do an allocation from demand types to products. 
And then when I actually do this allocation, uh, there's a third set of resources and a product, or rather this allocation itself could consume uh, different sets at different rates of these resources. Okay, so now I'm talking about something that's actually quite a bit more general. And it's something that I could tailor to capture AdWords. So with AdWords, I associate each advertiser one-to-one -one with each resource. Um, the weight of one of these allocation uh, would be, well, BIJ, let me call it PIA here. So sorry to change the notation from J to A. Um, and when I do an allocation, I consume minus PIA of this budget BA. But I could also think about fitting ad display here. So I do an allocation. What happens, same thing, except that now the budget is sort of a capacity. And when I do an allocation, I just consume one unit of this budget. OK? So the algorithm that you can use to handle um, a model like this is a model predictive control type algorithm. So like in all the problems that we looked at, looked at and all the models that we looked at before, um, you can still think about a crystal ball telling you what an offline optimum is. So um, let's actually imagine that you know, each one of these uh, users comes in uh, with a rate lambda i as a function of t over time. And I can count the number of arrivals that will arrive over time as this integral of lambda ij dt. And then what I can do is I can actually set up some kind of deterministic uh, LP, like uh, in a fluid analysis, uh, where I'm trying to maximize the revenues that come from uh, the arrivals actually being equal to this, uh, to this uh, quantity that you know in hindsight, and then subject to a budget constraint and a supply constraint. So now the question is, usually what I would, if I was living in, in sort of a classical pure uh, fluid model, what I would do is I would just approximate these arrivals with a lambda i times t. Now, because the rate itself is something stochastic, I can't do that anymore, okay? So what can I do? Well, there's this idea of model predictive control um, where you sort of build the system as you go along. So as you go along, you observe the world and whatever you're observing today, you're kind of using it as a forecast for the future. You build a simple model of the world going to the future and you just kind of re-optimize this and keep doing this over and over again, kind of rebuilding these models. And at the end of the day, you hope you get something better. So the algorithm that I'm gonna describe does exactly this. So, what kind of deterministic linear program could I solve if um, I is the decision maker where at some time t, okay? Well, what I would wanna do is I would wanna get some kind of estimate of how many arrivals I'm gonna get from little t to cap t to the end of the time horizon. And what I'm gonna do is I'm simply gonna measure what the process current rate is so lambda t, and I'm just gonna extrapolate that through the end of the time horizon, this rate is gonna stay the same, okay? So if this rate is gonna stay the same, then the arrivals that I'm gonna observe are lambda i of t times t minus little t. Um, and I can actually plug that into the linear program, into a deterministic linear program, get a control, and let's say that I actually use this control, this XIA, all the way up to T plus some uh, time and some time window delta. Okay. And I can keep doing this, kind of reusing re these rates, um, extrapolating, building a new model, and just re optimizing this model maybe every uh, time window um, delta. Okay. So here I update my current rate, I extrapolate, I build a new model. Uh, that uses this newly observed rate, okay? So what's actually potentially nice about this? Um, 
if I was going to compare this versus adversarial, so why could this be a sweet spot? If I was going to compare this to adversarial, I'm actually back to making LPs or optimization my modeling language. So potentially, this is something that's going to be much more flexible to adapt uh, compared to a pure adversarial model. Well, versus fluid, you know, clearly a, a less restrictive model of um, uncertainty than a classical fluid model. <laughs> so what is the exact model for which this kind of model predictive control algorithm uh, would actually work well? Yeah. Well, one shape of this actual rate process, lambda t, is to actually make lambda t as just essentially a Gaussian process. So just a sequence of random uh, Gaussian shocks, a sum of random Gaussian shocks. Okay, think about this as some kind of Arma Rima type uh, process. Okay, it actually turns out that you can get uh, guarantees for uh, this type of model. Okay, so I'm running a little bit out of time, so let me just jump uh, straight to uh, the point of this. Um, it actually turns out that if you pick uh, something that belongs to this family of processes, okay, and by the way, for instance, something that's nice about this is uh, within this family, you could actually get non-stationary processes. So potentially now you're really kind of jumping significantly away from fluid models and significant, significantly closer to the sort of hardness regime of an adversarial model. It actually turns out that no matter what process uh, you actually pick, uh, so even for whatever you know, variability of the process, uh, uh, nature actually throws at you. So nature actually gets to pick the process, but then the arrivals come from the process. Um, this model predictive control algorithm is going to get you at least uh, roughly a third of the offline optimal revenues. Okay? This is a uniform guarantee. So it's a uniform guarantee for anything that would actually come out of this process family. Um, and uh, this is something that, this is actually a, a sort of problem or a model of uncertainty that I've worked on. Uh, this is actually my, my job market paper and uh, I've actually been applying this to um, some other problems uh, as well afterwards. So uh, this recent paper here. But kind of what's the, what's the takeaway from this type of uh, stochastic rate model? Well, the takeaway is, you know, you, you, you have a fluid model, but you just, jump one step further. You make the fluid rate itself stochastic and potentially just via frequently re-optimizing uh, given how the fluid rate um, actually evolves over time, uh, maybe it, that in itself is something that's gonna give you some kind of constant factor guarantee like you could get with adversarial models. Um, and this is effectively what you're seeing in this proposition here. All right, so I'll end here um, by actually just coming back to that table that I started out with. So again, you know, since the topic was stochastic modeling, just figured I would give you, maybe open up a little bit more breadth of uh, how you can even approach stochastic modeling as a, as a problem in itself. Um, and as you can see, there's, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, each one of them that are, you know, yield computationally different algorithms uh, each one of them having different performance guarantees, uh, and each one of them having, you know, their own prospects of turning it into a technology versus just being something uh, sort of uh, more idiosyncratic. Uh, but certainly, I think something very interesting to think about if you're trying to pick up some new topics or, um, you know, do some new research in, uh, in uh, resource allocation, um, something to have in the back of your minds. Okay, so stop here. Uh, Victor, I apologize again for running. No worries. Out of time. Thank you for it. I'm, I'm converging. So, if there's another <laughs> session, maybe I can even converge to, right. to, yeah. to ending on time. Um, Questions, but, guys? Uh, we, we have, I mean, uh, of course, if you need to leave, uh, it's, uh, uh, you can do so. But if you, you have questions, uh, maybe we take a couple of them. I have one, but I want to leave it first to the floor and then I'll ask my question. After. Yeah, please go ahead. Any question first from the audience? So my question to you, Florin, maybe mm -hmm. this give time for someone to think of another question, um, is that, you know, the, you know the, um, so the, the, the fluid 
kind of uncertainty is really reducing, like you said, a let's say Poisson process to its rate, right? So the uncertainty is about to some extent the timing of the number of arrivals, right? Um, the other uncertainties I felt are different nature, and correct me if I missed it, is more about you know what you're getting, right? So we're basically shifting the the sequence, let's say, right? Uh, rather than the timing, right? So for me, it's it's very different type of uncertainty. And then the last one, the one, last one you talked about, yeah, goes back to more like timing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Did that? My understanding is correct. Uh, that's correct. I mean, um, but so when you're talking about sequence, you're talking about some random order model or adversarial right. model, or exactly. I mean, so those that were not about the timing of the thing, right? It's about, you know, basically, you know, um, and yeah, in fact, the way you no, okay, good. I think it really kind of comes down to the same thing. I, the, there's, there's, so I kind of swept under the rug one difference um, when you actually even define what's arriving or sort of what's your unit of, of accounting. Right. Uh, because when you're talking about uh, fluid models, um, there's kind of a notion of a type. Okay, so there's a notion of a type of a particular user. And then you're thinking about, you know, what's the, what's the number of uh, this, how many users of this particular type are actually arriving at, you know, T1, T2, so on and so forth. Um, so I think when you're talking about timing, you're sort of thinking about, you know, how does this, how does this actually shift over time? Like, you know, how does it actually move? So the actual density of arrivals of this particular user type. Um, when you're talking about uh, random order or adversarial models, um, actually people just kind of do away with the concept of a type in the first place. So they're just thinking about unit users. So there's a single user uh, that's, think about it as you know, each type has a density of exactly one. And then what you're changing is the sequence. So, so this guy arrives here, and this guy arrives here, and this guy arrives here, and so on and so forth. So, so this is more, this is maybe more about sequence. Right. right. Um, but I don't think that the I, I don't think the difference is fundamental. So if we're, if we're thinking, for example, how to measure uncertainty, in yeah. one case it would be easy to define what's a let's say the variance of, you mm -hmm. know, of that. and the other one it's it's much more complex and quite. Different. Um, perhaps. I mean, I, I actually struggled with this when I was trying to sort of do this in real life. Um, because so if you want to apply these kinds of methods here, um, in real life, if you actually look at that, if you actually look at uh online advertising data, and so there's some public data sets, by the way, if you guys want to look at these things. Um when you actually look at the data, you're literally looking at a vector of bits, B1, B2, B3. Like this is, this is an arrival. Um, and then the question is, you know, if you want to apply some kind of fluid methodology where there's a clear notion of a type, the question is, how do you bucket this particular arrival into a user type? Right, so that you can start calculating some variances or statistics like uh, like right. what you're thinking about. Yeah. So then maybe you need to do some kind of cluster. Like uh, you cluster a bunch of different arrivals that have similar bids, you cluster them into a single type. Mm -hmm. And then you calculate the variance for this single type. But I mean, you're right that actually the way that a lot of systems work are in a very discrete fashion where there's not a clear concept of a type and of a rate of a particular type. So, I mean, there's, way to, there's, there's ways to get around this, like this clustering approach that I'm talking about, but uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of an issue. Mm -hmm. But it's, I don't think it's a fundamental issue. Like, I don't think that there's just a clear wall between these two ways of, of doing things. So we could imagine an adversarial with a, Let's say Poisson. I mean that. Um, I mean, for instance, you could imagine an adversary that is constrained to, you know, m different types of uh, of users, but then what the adversary can do is it can adversarially pick the lambdas. 
So there's there's these types uh, types of users, and you know, in one hour time interval, the lambda for this type is a thousand, and another uh, time interval it's zero, and then it goes up to a million. So so the lambdas are picked adversary. Right. And to be honest, my sense, I've never tried thinking about this, but my sense is that it would not be in any way a, an easier problem than sort of the discrete problem that I showed you here. Like you'd still get one minus one over E, there would be nothing extra that you could do to help. I mean, basically, in, if, if, and I, I would, uh, it feels that it's, I would agree with you as well in the sense that what makes one quasi fluid, it will make the other quasi fluid, right? So in other words, like, you know, What's making the kind of adversarial almost, you know, fluid to be able to use a concentration inequality will make the Poisson process almost, uh, you know, kind of a deterministic rate, right? So it's kind of uh, right. Yeah. You, yeah. you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, any other question? All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, All right. Next Thanks. time. Thanks, guys. It's gonna be Philip. Uh, talking about a different uh, type, I mean, different approach to uh, uh, to platform, in particular, an application to write here. Um, so have a good one, and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye, everyone.